Lenton Mallory's life began in the Jim Crow South and he often faced discrimination. But as he writes in his autobiography, let's roll this train, those obstacles rarely dissuaded him. In fact, he often relished the challenges they presented. His life has been full of firsts. First black principal in Albuquerque, first black legislator in New Mexico, first black county commissioner in Bernalillo County. He tells correspondent Megan Kermrick what drove him to focus on education and to pursue a career in politics. Lenton Mowry, thank you for being here on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for having me, Megan. Well, you grew up quite poor on a farm in rural Louisiana. How did your parents push you toward a different path? Well, my, uh, my mother really was uh, only like white on rice to get an education. <laughs> and um, we, the little two, two, uh, two teacher uh, grade school that I attended, uh, after that, uh, a lot of the Negro kids uh, uh, couldn't go any further because we didn't have any bus mm -hmm. service. Uh, the, the white kids lived in the area, they had bus service, and they went to Greenwood High School. But what saved me more than anything else is my mom had a sister that lived in Shreveport. And uh, so my mom had my, me to go to live with her in Shreveport, Louisiana, and uh, that's how I got out of that situation. But they impressed on you that you need to get my education. My mom used to try to read with me by lamplight, you know, and, wow. and, and to tell you, you need to, you need to, you need to really get an education. And I, I, I carried out her wishes. So you also grew up in the Jim Crow South and segregation, and then you finally lived and worked in an integrated situation when you went into the Air Force yeah, that, in the 1950s. What kind of challenges did well, that, that present? That was kind of a life-changing uh, situation, you know, leaving uh, the uh, rural area and leaving the segregated situation and going into the Air Force, which is a kind of a broad situation. First, I was stationed in uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And it was an integrated situation that had not, it was in the early 50s and the, the integration had just taken place. And uh, we had a few incidents, but not nothing serious. And then after I um, left there, after my basic training, they sent me in a Boxdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana. I said, wait a minute, I changed. <laughs> I joined this Air Force to see the world, and you're sending me back home, where I grew up at Boxdale Air Force Base. But I was only there about 11 months, and then I went to London, England, and then my whole life changed when I went to London, England. Why talk about that? Well, um, first of all, uh, I worked in the education office, and after I'd been there about uh, two weeks, um, the education officer came in my office, and he says. Uh, I've been watching you, and I got kind of scared, you know, you've been watching me. He says, uh, you're very smart, but you're a Negro, and offered you, in order for you to reach your potential, you have to get a Ph.D. I was so glad to have a bachelor's, I wasn't even thinking about a Ph.D., mm -hmm. but he said, I'm enrolling you in London University on Tuesdays and Thursday classes, education classes, and I want you to attend. So, yes, sir. And my whole life changed. Uh, I mean, I got in that class, and a friend of mine, uh, Cunningham uh, from Scotland, became friendly with me, and he said, you're from the base. I said, yeah. He said, um, can you get us some cigarettes? <laughs> and I said, well, sure. I don't smoke. But he says, I want you to be a part of our group. I didn't know what group he was talking about, but that Thursday I brought two packs of cigarettes, and he took me t to the pub, which is uh, uh, kind of a bar mm -hmm. you know, outside of uh, university there and he says uh, I saw a group of people sitting over in the corner he says uh, this is Lenton Mowry he's from the base and he's going to uh, be a part of our group I didn't know what that meant he says now he explained to me that once a month we're going to go to um, uh, a, a city like Rome Paris etc cetera, etc cetera, and you're going to be part of our group and you're going to come to our flat and we're going to study some and we're going to party some so that's what we did for th uh, two and a half years. And so, and when you found in England, maybe the rest of Europe is like, things were all integrated. It was very different. Oh, everything was quite different. You know, the first weekend, the first trip we took was uh, uh, to Paris. And I, we was at the Moulin Rouge watching the Can Can Girls, and I kind of pinched myself, say, hey, this old country boy, I've come a long ways from Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I had a great time with that group. I mean, I got an education in class, but I got more of an education traveling with this group. We would go to Rome, we would go to, you know, Scotland, we would go to Madrid, Spain. We just, we just would travel a lot and, and some weekends individuals would have parties at their home and I was always the first one invited because I would bring the cigarettes. <laughs> It's <laughs> a great way. <laughs> How did that inform when you came back to the U.S. when you decided where did you want to live? Well, I came back and a strange thing happened. Um, Jack J. Shin from Rapid City, South Dakota was our education officer. And he was pushing me more than my mom was pushing me to get an education. He just kind of took over. He said, you, you have to get a Ph.D. So he enrolled me at Louisiana State University. and. Uh, when I got home, I had gotten out of the service about a month and a half earlier and to attend college. So um, he had worked all that out. So I get a telegram from LSU saying, you have to get this form signed by your previous principal to show you had good character. Well, I didn't think much about it until I went over and talked to Mr. Brown, who lived in the same block as my aunt. And uh, the legislature had passed this bill. And it says, uh, you have to get this signed by your principal, our previous principal, our principal. So I went over and he said, if I sign that, I'll lose my job. This is the way to keep blacks out of LSU. Mm. Now look at LSU now. <laughs> yeah. But back then, so what happened is uh, I had to get into school real fast. And uh, uh, school started that Monday, and this was Friday. So I uh, found out that Texas College in Tyler, Texas, offered a master's degree. So I called them up. I had missed two days, but they said, if you get over here now, we'll, we'll admit you. So I got over there, and that's when I met my, met my wife, Joy. She worked up in the registrar office. And then you both took teaching jobs out here in the West on the Navajo Reservation. Yeah, the, the Bureau of Indo Indian Affairs was recruiting African-American teachers. That's what brought you guys out here. Yeah, what happened, I worked one year in uh, Sherman, Texas, an assistant football coach and social study teacher. And then I uh, had already applied for a job on the reservation. I was, it was late summer in 57. I was trying to get a job and it was, I was just missing out on some of them. So I applied for the Navajo reservation. So they sent me a telegram in, all, in October saying we have a job for you. But I was already on the contract for that one year and I told them I would be interested the following year. So and I got married in the summer of 1958 and my wife and I packed up and came out to Kennedy, Arizona. What a life change that was. Did you see any commonality between what native kids were going through in terms of getting an education and what you had faced in a segregated yeah, South? Yeah, because I was teaching in a two rooms, uh, two teacher school and on the Navajo reservation at Kennedy. And I taught fourth, fifth, and sixth. And uh, Mr. Suntag taught uh, one, two, and three. And that's the kind of deal I grew up in on a two teacher uh, deal, you know. It was kind of brought back memories to So they didn't have a lot of resources either. Oh, no, they that... didn't have any resources. Yeah. Uh, I was at a boarding school. Some schools were day schools where kids would go in the day and go back home. But I was at a boarding school where the kids stayed there during the week. And uh, the parents would come and get them on weekends and brought them back Sunday afternoon. Do you guys eventually, you and your wife, moved to Albuquerque? Both got teaching jobs here, yeah. and you once more faced racism in housing when you went <laughs> to go buy a house in the Ridgecrest area. What happened? <laughs> well, this, this was kind of an interesting situation. We had jobs, and uh, I'd taken off that spring semester to work on my doctorate because Jack J. Shin kept calling and writing me, you gotta get, get that, that doctor, you gotta get that doctor. <laughs> so uh, I took off the spring semester of uh, 62 and came and lived in the dormitory here. And uh, we got our assignment. We had job, but we didn't have our assignment. So when we got our assignments, I was going to be at Lincoln Junior High School and my wife was going to be at Lowell Elementary School. So there was a kind of cl close, so we started looking for houses in the area. So looked at a house and uh, we, that Friday afternoon we found three houses uh, just, uh, west, just west of the Ridgecrest area. And um, we called the real estate guy, I think it was Brown Realtors, uh, so I mm -hmm. remember. And, and the guy said, yeah, we'll pick you up at nine o'clock in the morning. So we were all ready to go and the guy <laughs> knocked on the door and uh, he said, you guys are Negroes. I said, yeah, all our lives. He said, well, those houses were sold. 
I said, overnight? I called them Friday afternoon about 4 o'clock. This was Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I saw those call, houses were sold, all three of them were sold. He said, yeah, I'll show, I'll show you some houses in the uh, Kirkland edition. I said, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll do my own thing. So that afternoon we went and looked in the same area and we looked for houses for sale by owner. And we found one on the corner of uh, Gerard and Haida. And uh, I says, uh, I called a guy up, and he was a professor at UNM, and I says, uh, we want to come take a look at your house, but I'm going to tell you right now, we're Negroes. He said, for, just for that, I'm going to reduce the price for $200. And that's where we built, on the corner of Gerard and Haida for 12 years. I know that a that maybe that time and a couple times you went to look at houses, like there were actually crowds of neighbors there waiting yeah. for you. I mean, why did you decide to stay in the neighborhood after that? It sounds intimidating. I, I really, you know, I, you know I, I had lived in both a segregated situation and an integrated situation, you know, and I was coming now to another integrated situation. And I thought that I didn't think I would have that much trouble in finding houses in Albuquerque. But during those days, it was it was tough. Even even when I got this home, I bought this home, uh, I found out later they were trying to get up a petition to buy me out. And I tell you, who who saved me was a guy by the name of Judge McManus. Judge McManus was a district judge here. Mm -hmm. Later became a Supreme Court justice, and uh, he called the attorney office downtown and they sent people out in there and they were knocking on doors says I understand two Negroes live down on the corner you guys want to buy them out oh no no we don't have a he told me that st story later on after I was a state representative because he was a, a Supreme Court justice he used to have some of us legislators over and he told me that story. 1960s you decided to run for the legislature why were you interested in politics well I, I, I got interested for one reason uh, education was not getting this fair share of the money from the legislature and so what we did in 1966 in Johnson Jim we had a, a meeting of all a lot of educators from all over the state came and they spoke about uh, a guy by the name of Representative Foster from Demons, New Mexico, was the only educator in the legislature out of 112. And he spoke to us and he said, what we need to do is run more educators for the legislature. So we ran our first slate in 1966, ran about six or eight. Everyone lost except one guy by the name of Benito Chavez from Española. He won. And um, then we had a committee to go around getting other people to run. In 1968, they came to me and said, we want you to run. I said, I don't think so. I'm in the wrong district. I'm mm -hmm. in the Southeast Heights Ridgecrest area. And it's Republican. Now, the Republican is in that seat now. And they talked me into running. So we spent the whole summer of 1968 knocking on doors. Uh, I, we knocked on doors th three times, we walked the district three times. I was principal of La Mesa Elementary School at that time. And another guy came to my rescue, a guy by the name of Ben Raskob. He was a multimillionaire. And uh, he had us up on election night. Election night, everyone that's running for office want to be at home getting phone calls of how they're done in the different precincts. Are they going around to the different precincts? So he had invited my wife and I up for a steak down to my son. And I'm sitting there on pins and needles because the poll is closed. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what I, you know. So he turns to me, Mr. Raskob, said, we had a poll taken. And uh, you OK, you're going to win. And I said to myself, poll is one thing, but I want to see some eyeballs, some figures. So I went down to Vanderlil School, and my opponent was there. He came up and shook my hand. He said, congratulations. You were, it was a Republican district, clearly predominantly white, yeah. not very welcoming to right. African Americans. Why do you think you won? I, I just think that education was a big factor. Mm. I think education was, I t I, that's what my platform was, do more for education. And that Plus, resonated. You know, there's a lot of good white people in, in, in the world and in, in Albuquerque, you know, and they just, uh, you know, they just saw me as someone that they trusted and someone, and they elected me five times. You know, in your autobiography, Let's Roll This Train, you write when you're door knocking, one neighbor in particular, you on your first campaign, he used the N word, he said he wouldn't vote for you. When you ran for like the fourth time, he actually wanted one of your signs 
for his yard. So you said this, this proved guy, to you uh, that people can change. This guy was named Mr. White. He was originally from Mississippi. And I knocked on, you know, most individuals when you knock on the door, uh, they'll take your brochure and they may throw it in the trash before you get off their property, but they'll take it. And this guy says, you know, I, 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 you know, he kind of shocked me. He said, I don't let <laughs> come to my front door. And I went around to the back door and put my brochure in it. I wouldn't do that today. I wouldn't ever do that. <laughs> oh, no. in, that yeah. in 1907, I made sure to knock on his door again. He just took the brochure. In 72, he wanted to talk about uh, Pete Domenici. Uh, Pete, Pete, I knew Pete the manager. Uh, um, he wanted to talk with you about it. He, huh? he wanted to say, uh, don't vote for that <laughs> I hadn't heard the word <laughs> since I was in Louisiana. And then he got on, um, McGovern was running for governor. He said, don't vote for that communist, McGovern. And I said, Mr. White, I just, I just do my own things. I don't get involved in other people's campaign. 1974 was the victory. I have, I'm, one, one uh, October afternoon, uh, he see me, he was sitting out in his yard, he see me coming down the street and I was, and uh, the, um, the year before I was chairman of the Health and Aging Committee and we passed some bills to help senior citizens, he was a senior citizen. He saw me coming down the road, he said, Dr. Mallory, come and have a seat. Uh, Betsy told his wife, go get Dr. Mallory of Coke. I didn't know whether they're drinking or not. You know, but uh, uh, he, ch he made a completely change. And he says, um, uh, a professor across the street had one of my signs in the, in the yard. He says, uh, uh, will you uh, get one of your people to put a sign? I mean, You're going to get three votes out of this house. Did that give you optimism that people can change? A lot of optimism. Huh. I was thinking, I thought about that a lot. You know, some people may... Uh, may be a racist or may not feel good about a minority, but after you prove to them that you're a human just like anyone else, you know, they, they, they can change. People can change. And then the next year he had gone, I don't know whether he passed away or moved or what, but uh, I, I often think about that situation, how this guy went from one extreme to another extreme. When you were in the legislature, you chaired the House Education Committee and you focused a lot on education issues. What do you see as your most important achievements? Most as a important lawmaker? bill I passed, I passed a lot of legislation, but the most important bill was the statewide kindergarten bill. We, uh, in 1973, was one of two states that didn't have kindergarten. And my wife was a first grade teacher and she kept lobbying me that these kids are not ready when they come to first grade. They need, uh, they need kindergarten. So she lobbied me and lobbied me. I introduced the bill the first year I was there and it didn't get out of, I was on the education committee and that didn't it get didn't out get of out my of own <laughs> committee. <laughs> So then the following year, the 1971, I, I passed, I introduced, it passed out of the house and it, uh, it died in the Senate and I found out that Aubrey Dunn, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, was holding up my bill. So uh, every other Wednesday morning, Bruce King would have all the chairmen over for breakfast. And so I was a new chairman and I went over and I told, <clears throat> told Aubrey, I says, uh, you and I need to go to uh, Bullring and have lunch. And he said, oh, you want to talk about your babysitting bill? I said, no, that's not what the I want. The babysitting bill, that's what he called that's it. That's what he okay. called it, babysitting bill. And I said, no, I want to talk about the two bills you have in my committee. <laughs> he said, what's wrong with my two bills? I said, probably the same thing wrong with my kindergarten bill in your committee. <laughs> he said, okay, let's go to have Bull Rang go to lunch tomorrow. So he, he promised me we'd get my bill out of, out of committee. So I, he didn't tell me he was going to speak against it, but um, uh, one of the senators came over when my bill was getting ready to be debated on the floor. and said, you better come over and make sure Aubrey don't, don't get up. So I went over and sat right on his desk. And I said, don't get up. And to, oppose, to oppose your bill. I, I, yeah. I don't want, if he had gotten up and spoke against it, he would have died, I know. So he said, well, I am going to get up. He got up and walked and went to his office. <laughs> Man, was I happy. <laughs> I went to his office. <laughs> I, I, my bill passed by two or three votes and Bruce King signed it. That's how we got kindergarten in the state of New Mexico. So how has New Mexico changed since you first came here? Well, in many ways, uh, you know, first of all, um, uh, when I first came here, Wyoming probably was the farthest uh, paved street. And the, and the city moved uh, east. Tramway and uh, 
and, and uh, Candelaria, I mean, tramway and further east. And then when it stopped going east, it went, uh, it went north for a while, and then it went uh, west. So a lot of things now is, is in the western part of the city, and when it wasn't there when I came. What about the, the general climate in terms of discrimination or business development? I think development? discrimination has been eliminated uh, a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. we probably st still have some discrimination, but it, uh, housing discrimination, for example, doesn't, I don't think, exist anymore. Uh, if you have the money, you can buy a house anywhere you want to. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's progress. But we probably still have some underlying discrimination. What role do you think you played in some of those changes? Well, I city? hope I played a positive role. You know, I did a lot of things that to help people. In fact, in fact, all the bills that I passed in the legislature was something to help someone and uh, help a group of people or help individuals. And when I was a county commissioner, I also tried to do uh, things to help people. But the, the eight years I was a county commissioner. I know you've spent most of your life focused on improving education here in New Mexico, and um, we still face some big challenges in this area. You note in the last chapter of your book that there are a lot of things that still need to be done. What do you think, what would you like to see happen? Well, I think the most important thing we need in the state of New Mexico is pre-kindergarten. I passed a kindergarten bill in 1973, and we way overdue pre-kindergarten. Uh, I just hope the legislature will find the money somewhere. There's a bill up there now to, to do something in that area. I, I, just, I just see us really needing to do something in, in, in pre-kindergarten. We need to get these kids earlier mm -hmm. and then we're getting them now. Well, Lenton Mowry, thank you so much for coming and talking to us on New thank Mexico you. in Focus. Thank you.